Today's lecture will be on Chapter 5, but first let's look at some review questions. Penicillin and lysozyme are effective against A, gram-positive bacteria, B, gram-negative bacteria, C, both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. So both penicillin and lysozyme attack the peptidoglycan layer. They attack those cross bridges and they basically dismantle the peptidoglycan. Gram-positive bacteria has numerous layers of peptidoglycan in their cell wall. You can imagine that penicillin and lysozyme would be able to dismantle and attack those peptidoglycan layers and be very effective against it. If you look at the gram-negative bacteria, you just have that very thin layer of peptidoglycan in the cell wall. And it's sandwiched between two plasma membrane layers. So it's basically protected from the pen penicillin and the lysozymes. So by looking at this question and thinking about the layers of gram-positive bacteria and the layers of gram-negative bacteria and what penicillin and lysozyme actually do, we can say that penicillin and lysozyme are effective against A, gram-positive bacteria. Southern blots are A, genetic fingerprints, B, DNA hybridization procedures, C, phenotypic tests. The answer is B, DNA hybridization procedures. Remember, a southern blot is looking for the genetic similarities between two different things. Classification of microbes relies primarily on blank for genetic comparison. A, ribosomal genetic material. B, DNA fingerprints. C, plasmid. D, genomic. The answer is A, ribosomal genetic material, RNA. DNA fingerprints, remember, is just a test for a quick comparison of species. A plasmid is just a piece of genetic material. And genomic, that doesn't really fit. Which of the following eukaryotic cell structures was a microbe according to the endosymbiotic theory? Is it A, nucleus, B, ribosome, C, chloroplast, or D, endoplasmic reticulum? The answer is C, chloroplast. According to the endosymbiotic theory, remember both mitochondria and chloroplasts were thought to be originally bacteria that invaded into a eukaryotic cell, and the eukaryotic cell accepted it as part of its makeup. And as it replicated, it replicated the chloroplasts and the mitochondria within them because those structures were providing them energy. So if you don't quite remember the endosymbiotic theory and especially the evidence for the endosymbiotic theory, make sure you look back so you are prepared for quizzes and exams. What is the significant anatomical feature of eukaryotes? Is it A, the cell wall, B, histones and chromosomal packing, C, nucleus, D, plasma membrane, E, antibiotic resistance. The answer is C, nucleus. Remember, a eukaryote has a true nucleus. Prokaryotes, both bacteria and archaea, do not have a nucleus. 
So let's look at chapter 5, eukaryotes. That includes fungi, algae, protozoa, and helminths. The first eukaryote that we are going to look at is fungi. The study of fungi is called mycology. There are many different scientific fields that um, the individ individuals within those fields can study fungi. Botanists study fungi, ecologists study fungi. We are going to look at fungi from a microbiology perspective. Now most fungi are chemo organotrophic aerobes, which means they use carbon for their sources of energy. Some fungi are actually classified as carnivores, which means they capture their prey. Some yeasts are very exceptional. Yeasts are single-celled fungi, and they can serve as facultative aerobes. They can be used in ethanol fermentation for bioremediation purposes. They can digest sugars. We use yeasts in bread making. Yeasts are a very interesting type of fungi. Molds are filamentous fungi. They have many branches, and some of these branches can exist for miles on the ground. Macrofungi would be things like mushrooms. These images show you three different types of fungi. The top image is a unicellular, single-celled yeast. If you look in the lower left-hand side, that's penicillium. That's a type of mold that you might find on bread or that fuzzy mold that might grow on a strawberry. On the right-hand side, that is an image that represents a spore, which is about to erupt and replicate itself. In these images, you can see the top left, this is black mold. You might have heard of black mold. Black mold can cause very severe respiratory issues. Some people have to have their homes extensively clean because they might have black mold within their walls. You can see by that image that black mold has this barbed wiry, presentation to it and that's why it can grip and hold and get into those respiratory mucous membranes and cause such problems for people. If you look on the lower right hand side these are bottle cap fungi and they look like they're very pretty and something that you would like to be around but this bottle cap fungi actually grows on horse poop and when they explode and spread their spores they can spread them with tremendous force so if you see this really pretty fungus and you might want to look at it don't get too close because when they erupt to replicate themselves they can really tremendously push those spores out with a lot of force The top right image is of a carnivorous fungi. It can create like a little lasso and encircle its prey. It likes to capture little nematodes and use those for its food sources. The mushroom down in that lower left looks really wicked and you can totally imagine that this mushroom is very toxic. And you would be right. But a lot of fungi and a lot of mushrooms do not look this nasty. So when you are mushroom hunting, you really need to know what you are doing and be very, very careful when you pick mushrooms because there are many mushrooms that are toxic and actually can be lethal. 
So here is a phylogenetic tree of three domains. It has the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. If you kind of look on the top portion of that eukarya, you can see that fungi are very close to animals. And they are. We are very similar to fungus. That is why it's so difficult to treat fungal infections. And I will talk about this quite a bit throughout the class. Because we have structures that are very similar to fungi, the problem with treating them very harshly with very toxic type of treatments to get rid of them, which sometimes you have to do in order to rid the body of a fungal infection, the difficulty comes in that when you use these toxic types of treatments to kill the fungus, you could also potentially harm and damage our cells. And we would have an increased amount of side effects, increased amount of signs and symptoms, and we could have some complications from the treatment. So when we have fungal infections, unfortunately, we have to treat them at very low levels of medications because we don't want to harm our own cells. And sometimes, unfortunately, because we have to use such low levels of treatments, it takes a long time to get rid of a fungal infection. And sometimes we're not able to get rid of these fungal infections at all. They just kind of simmer along and stay within our body systems, unfortunately. Athlete's foot can be very difficult to get rid of. Or people you might know have toenail fungus um, that's also very difficult to treat. There are many infections caused by fungi that are very hard to treat in us. Let's talk about the growth forms of fungi. Fungi can produce hyphae. Hyphae are like branches. They are filamentous cellular growth extensions. When we consider fungal pathogens, we need to know that many are dimorphic, which means they can exist unicellularly, like a yeast, or they can exist as hyphae under certain circumstances. Mycelia, or mycelium, are tangled masses of hyphae tangled masses of these branches. They're like tendrils of cells that get all intertwined. And typically they are located under surfaces, under the ground. Molds are the exception and can grow on surfaces, like how black mold can produce these tangled masses, these tangled branches on walls. Now, fungi reproduce asexually, which means they disseminate progeny as spores. Now, you have to be careful with this word spores. It is not the same as endospores. Remember, endospores can occur in some bacteria. Some bacillus produce these endospores in order to protect their genetic material during harsh environments when they're in uh, too much heat or there's chemicals present. When something is making their survival difficult, they can protect their genetic material until the conditions are much better for them. An endospore is not the same thing as a spore, which is a mode of asexual reproduction. Unfortunately, sometimes your textbook uses the word spores in place of the word endospores. So when you're reading and you're reading about bacteria, make sure you understand that when you see that word spores, it means an endospore. Endospores go with bacteria. 
and they go with bacillus in particular. But when you see the word spores and it's related to your reading about fungi, then you need to know that they're talking about the asexual mode of reproduction of fungi. So mushrooms are above ground fruiting bodies, which can produce spores. They have asexual reproduction. They can disseminate progeny as spores. This is an image of what mycelium can look like. You might have seen something like this in your own yard when you've been outside and you might have thought that it was a spider web or something else, but actually it's a fungus and it's a tangled mass of hyphae and it has formed this mycelium layer. It has come up through the ground and formed this layer in the grass. You might have heard of the humongous fungus. It is in the Malheur National Forest here in Oregon. And it is one of the largest and oldest growths of mycelium. Fungi can be crucial decomposers. They can break down material and liberate the nutrients. In agriculture, fungi has been used to make better use of the land by decomposing material and releasing carbon and nitrogen and sulfur. Fungi can secrete proteins, exoenzymes, that can digest extracellularly outside of their bodies. They can create symbiotic relationships with plants and with algae. But remember, symbiotic relationships can be positive and they can also be negative. They can be harmful or they can be beneficial. When they are beneficial relationships, fungi can help plant roots to grow stronger. Fungi also contributes to infectious diseases. There are fungal infections that can occur in plants like powdery mildew. They can occur and wipe out entire crops. There are also fungal infections that can occur in animals like bats. Bats can develop this powdery, white looking fungus that grows on their noses. And it doesn't kill them, but it can disturb their sleep. And so they wake up during the day. And if they're out during the day, they can't find the food they need. The bugs and the things that they eat are out at night. And so essentially bats will end up starving to death if they develop this fungal infection on their noses because their patterns are disrupted and they come out during the day and can't find what they need to survive. So infectious diseases caused by fungi can be very, very serious. They also contribute to many serious infections in humans from oral thrush to yeast infections. And we will talk more about those when we get to infectious diseases. Let's look at these images. Which one is edible? Is it A or is it B? 
The answer is B. B would be the edible type of mushroom. A is actually what's called a death cap mushroom. These would be fatal if you ate them. Now my son and his friends like to go out and they hunt mushrooms a lot. They study fungi, they are pretty good at identification, but I still am just a little bit leery. He'll bring me home a bag of mushrooms and do I eat them? Mm, not always because I am not good at identification. I really do not know um, my mushrooms very well. And thinking of taxonomy, we have to be able to identify things accurately to protect us, to keep us safe. So things like eating a death cap instead, instead of a chanterelle um, doesn't happen. Identification is very important. So again, do not eat A, but you can eat B. Arthropod vectors is a very important topic that you need to understand. A mechanical vector carries microbes to a new host outside of their bodies. It's like if you were having a picnic and a fly was flying by and it flew onto some horse poop nearby and it picked up contaminants from the horse poop, flew over to the happy picnic that you were having and landed on your sandwich. That is a mechanical vector. It transfers something from the outside of its body to something else. So it's on the outside, it is not on the inside. It's carried on their feet or it's carried on their mouths. It just depends, it's on the outside. A biological vector, on the other hand, carries the microbe inside of its body, inside, through some aspect of its life cycle. This microbe lives inside of a biological vector. This is like a mosquito that carries a plasmodium or a protozoa that causes malaria. It carries this protozoa inside of its body through the life cycle of this plasmodium. And then it can transfer malaria to another host because it's carrying it inside. Another term that you need to know is arthropod. An arthropod is a terrestrial animal with an exoskeleton and jointed legs. That would be like an insect, like flies, bed bugs, mosquitoes, fleas, and lice. Arachnids include the ticks and the spiders. This is an excellent image from your textbook that shows a mechanical vector and a biological vector. So on the left, you can see that mechanical vector. That fly is flying around. It lands on something and picks up something contaminated. It picks up a pathogen and it's on its feet and it lands on your food, transferring it from the outside of its body onto something else. And then you would eat it and then you could get sick from that pathogen, from that mechanical vector. The biological vector is like that mosquito. An infected mosquito can come and land on a person and inject that pathogen that has been living in its body into that uninfected person who now becomes sick because it has been transferred into them. Another mosquito could fly along and inject itself into that person and pick up that pathogen and then carry it to another person. The key for the biological vector, remember, it's carried on the inside of something else, like the inside of that mosquito. That pathogen, in the case of malaria, it's called a plasmodium, which is a protozoa. It lives inside of that mosquito. 
growing and replicating, living within it, and then that mosquito can transfer it to another person. It's inside of that arthropod. A bed bug is a mechanical vector. They can live in furniture, like beds, like couches, things that are soft. They can reproduce in this furniture. They live, they eat, they feed, they poop, they crawl around and all of that stuff, all of their poop and everything else. Um, and they pick up bacteria on the outside of their bodies, on their feet. It can be on their mouths. They can pick up staff. And when they bite you, which they like to do at night because bed bugs are nocturnal, if they bite you and they've had staff in their mouths or on their mouths, then they can transfer that staff to you. They are a mechanical vector. Whatever they pick up is on the outside of their bodies. And they can transfer it to you through a bite because they can pick it up on their mouths or on their feet, which they can drag through your body when they do their little bites. So bed bugs are a mechanical vector. Whatever they pick up, the pathogen, the bacteria, whatever it is, they transfer it from the outside side of their body to you. This is a mosquito. I'm sure you've seen mosquitoes. Now mosquitoes are biological vectors. They can pick up a bacteria and they carry that bacteria, if it's a pathogen, inside of their bodies. It can live inside their bodies, develop, grow, reproduce, and they can transfer it to you when you get a mosquito bite. Mosquitoes transmit a lot of different types of infectious diseases. Malaria, West Nile, Zika. All of these infectious diseases are diseases that we will talk about later on in the class. But remember, a mosquito is a biological vector and it's carrying the, plas the plasmodium if it's malaria. They're carrying the pathogen, whatever it is, the bacteria, whatever it is, the microbe inside of their bodies and transmitting it to you through a bite. So let's talk about lice. When we talk about head lice and crabs or pubic lice, usually the infections that occur with both of those are considered to be caused in a mechanical vector sort of way. The lice carries something on the outside of a, its body. It can cause itching and they can reproduce and they can cause a lot of problems. That's true. Both head lice and pubic lice can cause problems. That is very true. But they are generally in the form of an infection caused by a mechanical vector. When we talk about body lice though, body lice has been known to carry certain types of bacteria within itself so it will become a biological vector and transmit this bacteria that has grown within it. Remember the biological vectors carry something inside of it through a certain part of the life cycle. So body lice can be biological vectors. They can transmit infections through their bites. Fleas are also another kind of complicated type of vector. A flea can transmit things like the plague. You might have heard about how fleas caused the Black Death, how they caused the bubonic plague. And we are going to talk about that in a later lecture. Fleas can also carry things though on the outside of their bodies. They could pick up staph, which can cause an infection when they bite you. So they can 
carry different types of things from things like staff to things like the plague. That is true. They could bite something that's infected and then bite you and transmit it. So fleas are also a vector. Here is an image that represents how a lot of people feel about spiders. Spiders can be very frightening to some people. It could be the way they move, the way they dart, the way they're unpredictable. I'm not quite sure. My son is very afraid of spiders. Luckily, I'm not so that I can capture the spiders and take them outside because spiders can do a lot of good um, outside. So I try to capture them and take them outside for him, but he will wake me up in the middle of the night if he sees a spider, no matter how small it is. And I will capture it and take it outside. Now, a spider is a mechanical vector. Most of the spiders in our area are not venomous. Are there venomous spiders? Yes, there are. And yes, there are brown recluse spiders out there that can cause very serious infections. There are other types of spiders that are venomous. But for the most part, for the most part, spider bites are usually infected by Staphylococcus. If a spider bite looks red and swollen, it's usually not from a venomous spider. It's usually because the spider is a mechanical vector and it's transmitted that bacteria, Staphylococcus, from its bite into your skin and it becomes infected. You usually can suspect a staph infection, right? If the lesions don't heal, especially, you can suspect it's a staph infection. Venomous spider bites cause an infection and cause a wound very, very rapidly. Usually a staph infection from a spider bite kind of builds upon itself and it can show up later and become worse later. It won't heal. So usually a bite from a spider, which is a mechanical vector, is from Staphylococcus. So helminths or parasitic worms are eukaryotes. They have a nucleus. Remember, helminths are also very similar to us, like fungi. So we have to be very careful when we treat them. They can also be difficult to treat when we have an infection from a parasitic worm, just the same as fungi is difficult to treat. So helminths are multicellular animals. They are chemoheterotrophic, which means they can fix carbon for energy. You can have flatworms and roundworms. You can have flukes or tapeworms, which are flatworms. You can have nematomes. Those are the nematodes, are the roundworms. There are hookworms and pinworms. There's many, many different types of worms. Hookworms can be found in the sand on beaches, especially in developing countries. And if you're walking in the sand on these beaches that are infected with hookworms, you can get what's called a creeping eruption infection. When you're walking, the little hookworms can grab onto the bottom of your feet and they can burrow deep inside and cause an infection. So you have to be very, very careful and probably should wear shoes when you're out on the sand on beaches. Trematodes or flukes are a flatworm. They look like ribbons. There's thousands of different species of trematodes. Usually they're parasites of amphibians and reptiles, but they can infect humans. They can be fatal if we do have an infection from a trematode. They can burrow deep 
into our blood vessels and get into our bloodstream and go throughout our body. They can attach to the mucous membranes of the intestines or the lungs. They can burrow deep into them. Usually, we are infected from a trematode or a fluke because of ingestion of raw or undercooked fish, crayfish, snails, or watercress because the trematodes like to infect those. And if we eat them raw or undercooked, then we do not get rid of the trematodes and we can ingest them and they can cause great damage and serious infections that can cause death. Tapeworms are another parasitic helminth. We can ingest the larva of a tapeworm from undercooked contaminated meat. Some of the infections that occur from the ingestion of a tapeworm don't have any symptoms, but others can have anemia, pain, and diarrhea. And tapeworms can grow very large. They can grow so large that they cause obstructions or even burst your intestines. Also, sometimes tapeworms can get into the bloodstream and get past the blood-brain barrier and can migrate to the CNS causing neurological symptoms and can also end up being fatal. What's interesting and kind of sad about tapeworms is there used to be this fad of people purchasing tapeworms on the internet and eating them so that they could lose weight. Because a tapeworm is going to grow inside of your intestines and eat all of the food that you eat. So it's surviving off of what you eat. And so people would buy tapeworms and ingest them so that these tapeworms would eat the food that they were eating and they could use it as a diet method. This was a really horrible idea because of the serious things that a tapeworm can cause. And like some other things that people buy on the internet, once um, places like Facebook and eBay and things like that found out about the tapeworms being sold for people as a diet remedy, they shut it down as quickly as they could because it can be fatal. This is an image from your textbook that shows the suckers on a liver fluke and the suckers on a tapeworm that comes from pork. Um, You can also see that the tapeworm on the right has these little hooks. And in the next image, you can really see these hooks that it can use to attach to the mucous membranes within your intestines. So here again, you can see the tapeworm has these little hooks that it can use to maneuver around and attach to your mucous membranes. And on the right, they have these bodies that can kind of separate. They're like little segments and they're able to weave their way through your intestines. This is a great image from the CDC that shows the tapeworm life cycle. It shows that pig coming along and eating feces that might be contaminated with tapeworms. If it eats these and it's contaminated with the tapeworm, the tapeworm gets into its body, into its system. And then when the pig is slaughtered for meat and then you eat the meat that's contaminated with the tapeworms that you don't cook well enough, then you can become sick from that contaminated undercooked pork. Pinworms are another type of helminth that we should talk about. They infect the anal area. One of the most prominent symptoms that you will have if you are infected with pinworms is itching. But what's interesting is that this severe itching takes a while for it to develop. It can develop from one to two months after you are infected with pinworms as these pinworms navigate down to the anal area. 
So pinworms can be transmitted by scratching the infected area. And when you prepare food, you can transfer those pinworms into the food. You can, from itching and not washing your hands, you can transfer them to surfaces. Um, children a lot of times will share pinworms because a lot of times they'll scratch their bottoms and then of course they're not going to wash their hands. Then they touch toys or they touch other things and they share them with their friends. So pinworms can be shared pretty easily between children especially. Pinworm infections are the most common worm infection in the developed countries of the world. So it is something that you should be aware of. Algae are photosynthetic eukaryotic organisms. They have a true nucleus. They also have chloroplasts so that they can use photosynthesis for their energy needs. What's interesting about algae is they're distributed on many different branches of the phylogenetic tree of life. And we'll look at that closely on the next page. Algae are aquatic. They like to be in watery types of environments. They are oxygenic phototrophs. They produce half of the world's atmospheric oxygen through photosynthesis. Algae can be unicellular, but they can also be very, very large and be multicellular. If you look at this representation of a phylogenetic tree with algae, you can see the green columns are algae and the red columns are protozoa. You also have plants um, that you can see on there. You can see fungus and you can see that the algae is related genetically to a variety of different things from plants to protozoa. They are very hard to classify because so many algae are so different from one another. Algae are very diverse, and we are going to talk about a few of the different types of algae next. There are thousands of species of algae, and they're very diverse. You can have green algae, which could be pond scum. You can have yellow green algae, golden brown algae. There are algae that form a crystallized silica skeleton. There's red algae, which is different from red tide, and we will talk about that. There is algae with flagella. There are many different types of algae, as you'll see in the next slide. This is an image from your textbook and it shows a few of the different types of algae. You can see the kelp in A. You've probably seen uh, images of large kelp forests. They can be very extensive. B, that's an example of a red algae. C, green algae, and it looks like a plant, doesn't it? There's D, which I think is really cool, which is that algae that kind of glows. It has that bioluminescence to it. And then there's E that can develop these silica skeletons. These are diatoms. Um, in F, you can see another type of green algae that looks very different from C. So even within the categories themselves, the types themselves for green algae, they can greatly vary. So you need to remember how diverse algae is. This is that image again from your textbook, and I included it here with the different types so you could see what the names of them were in case you wanted to look, look them up and study them a little more. You might have heard of red tide. It's a very harmful, dangerous algae bloom that can occur in the ocean. It can occur along the beaches. Um, it's called a harmful algal 
Bloom, an H-A-B. It's caused from dinophyta or dinoflagellates, as it's sometimes called. This type of algae can secrete a toxin that can be fatal. It creates these ocean dead zones where it completely depletes the oxygen. When the fish or the shellfish, the birds, the mammals, or us ingest the toxins from this harmful algae bloom, we can develop very serious infections that again can be fatal. They often have to shut down the fishing industry or the crabbing industry. You might have heard about that happening on the Oregon coast. They shut it down until these algae blooms dissipate because we want to make sure that the marine mammals and the fish and the shellfish and everything else in this area where these blooms are occurring have not ingested this toxin from the dinophyta because if you were to eat that seafood later on you could become very sick and possibly die. It is estimated that 82 million dollars are lost because of these closures, because of the fishing industry closures, because of the crabbing industry closures, because of the beach closures. Climate change has caused more red tides to develop. And unfortunately, there have been far more closures because of these climate change effects. If you want to know if a beach is close, you can go to the Oregon Health Authority and oftentimes they will post when a beach is closed or when the fishing industry is shut down and they will let you know when a red tide is uh, out there and has developed and they will let you know when it dissipates. This is an image of that red tide algae bloom. It really is kind of pretty, but remember this is very deadly to a lot of sea life. It creates those oxygen dead zones where nothing can live and it secretes that toxin that can be very, very harmful. In the news, you often hear about blue-green algae being found in a lake or a pond or a stream and they're having to shut down that area so no people go swimming and no dogs go playing in the water because um, this type of algae can be fatal. Um, it's actually a bacteria. It's a cyanobacteria, but it is often called blue-green algae because of the way it forms. And again, it is found in fresh water, like lakes or ponds or streams. Like the red tide, it can produce harmful toxins when it blooms. It blooms just like the red tide, but only a blue-green color. Cyanobacteria prefer warm, calm water. That's why it likes to grow in lakes and ponds and slow-moving streams, not rivers or oceans. Cyanobacteria is harmful to humans and animals, especially dogs. For some reason, cyanobacteria is very, very harmful to dogs, and it is often fatal in dogs. Signs and symptoms can include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, weakness, difficulty breathing, and seizures when it infects the CNS. The central nervous system. And again, this cyanobacteria, when it blooms like this, can be fatal. Now, you might have heard about a supplement called spirulina. And now this uses a cyanobacteria. Now, think back to when I talked about how you need to be careful about your supplements because it is not a regulated industry. If you use spirulina, you need to make sure that it is coming from a reputable company and they are not using a harmful form of this 
blue-green algae that has produced the toxins that can be fatal. You have to be very, very careful and make sure that you are ingesting the non-harmful form of this spirulina. So you can see from this image, it does look like red tide. It does look like that dinophyta that causes red tide, those algae blooms. So it does kind of make sense how it is often called a blue-green algae. You just need to remember that it's not actually an algae at all. It's a cyanobacteria. And if you actually think back to our first lecture, when we talked about bacteria being found from billions of years ago in fossils, cyanobacteria is the one that has, was found that was alive 3.5 billion years ago and was found in that fossil. So there are many different types of algae that can produce a toxin or they can produce a noxious type of gas. In France, a truck driver was found dead along the side of the road in July of 2009 following an extensive beach cleanup. There had been this great beach cleanup where they had gotten rid of all of this rotting algae that had grown and developed on these beaches. It was called sea lettuce. And so they had this truck driver haul loads of this rotting sea lettuce away to dispose of. Unfortunately, the rotting sea lettuce, this algae, produced a hydrogen sulfide gas, and it is thought to have caused his death. Let's talk about protozoa. Protozoa are non-photosynthetic motile proteins. They are eukaryotes. They have a true nucleus. They can be unicellular. They love aquatic and terrestrial environments. It needs to be moist. That's their happy place. They can replicate by asexual reproduction or sexual reproduction, both ways, depending on what type of protozoa it is. There are many different kinds. There are numerous diseases and infections caused by protozoa. We will talk about a few of them, especially at the end of the class. The ones I'm talking about here, the first one is Trichomonas vaginalis. That is a sexually transmitted infection. It causes vaginitis. Um, it's caused by a protozoa. Toxoplasma gondii. Um, you might have heard about this one, especially if you have cats or if you have been pregnant and have cats. Um, pregnant women should not clean cat boxes because Toxoplasma gondii can live in cat feces and scooping the cat litter boxes can transmit this uh, protozoa to the pregnant mom and then the baby can develop birth defects. We talked a little bit about the protozoa plasmodium. SSP means there are many species, multiple species. Now remember plasmodium causes malaria from a biological vector that is the mosquito. 300 million people a year are estimated to be infected with malaria. And 10% of these people who are infected each year will die. We will talk a lot about malaria later on in the class. This is a slide that shows that protozoa can also be diverse in their presentation, just like a lot of other microorganisms. Even though they're called protozoa, there's many different types of species of protozoa. So on the top on the left, um, you can see a representation of what an amoeba might look like. 
Below that, you can see the little giardia. If you are a backpacker or someone who likes to camp in the wilderness, you might know a little bit about giardia, and we will talk about that. On the right-hand side, um, in pond scum, you might see these little swimming things with true motility, and these are called rotifers. You might have heard of brain-eating amoebas. Yes, there are amoebas that can get past the blood-brain barrier and cause very serious and often fatal infections. Recent cases that have been in the news, one recent one was in Seattle. There was a woman who was using a neti pot because she had frequent sinus infections. And her physician had encouraged her to use a neti pot to help to aid in her symptoms. You can see from the image that you use this neti pot to rinse out your nasal passages with water. But the important thing to know about a neti pot and using a neti pot is you must use sterile water. You cannot use water from a faucet. You cannot use water from a shower head. Neti pots can be messy and some people might want to just stand in the shower and use the neti pot, but you can't use the water that's coming out of your tap. Especially if you have well water, you cannot guarantee that there are no amoebas in there. And your nose and your sinuses are very close to your brain. The amoeba does not have that far to go in order to reach your brain and cause very serious neurological symptoms and fatalities. Also in the news, you might have heard about people who have developed these brain-eating amoebas from swimming in fresh water. They have not used nose clips um, to protect themselves. They might have been playing at a water park that uses fresh water, and they might have inhaled some water through their nasal passages. And again, if there are amoebas in that fresh water, yes, they can sometimes get past the blood brain barrier. They are very rare. You need to know that these are very rare but they can occur in warm, fresh water. That's where they like to live. That's where they are the happiest. And yes, there is an amoeba that can get past that blood-brain barrier. So let's do some review questions. A fungal spore is A, a mode of reproduction, B, a survival cyst, C, is the same as a bacterial endospore. The answer is A. When we're talking about a spore and fungus, a fungal spore, it is a mode of asexual reproduction. Hyphae are A. Fruiting bodies, B. Unicellular structures, C. Cellular branches. Hyphae are C, cellular branches. Malaria is caused by A, a protozoa, B, a bacteria, C, an archaea, D, mycelia. The answer is A, a protozoa. Remember, malaria is caused by plasmodium, which is a protozoa. A mechanical vector is A, species-specific, or B, not species-specific. So a mechanical vector, remember, is something that could fly or crawl through something and pick up something, pick up a pathogen, pick up a bacteria on the outside of their body, then transfer it to you through a bite or some other way, land on your food and you ingest it. That's what a mechanical vector does. So the answer is B. 
is not species specific because anything can fly through something. Any arthropod can fly through something or an arachnid can crawl through something and bite you and transfer a staph infection. That is not species specific. It could be any type of arthropod that can become a mechanical vector like that. Anything that can crawl through and pick up something on the outside of its body, right? On the outside. A biological vector is species specific. There are certain types of of mosquitoes that can carry a plasmodium, a protozoa, through its life cycle inside, right? So that would be species specific. So a biological vector is species specific, but a mechanical vector is not. B. So that's the end of chapter five.